Hi and welcome to today's web course presentation with iTech. Today we have the CEO with us presenting Philip Chaban. My name is Martin Westerlund and I'm from Finwire. If you have any questions for Philip, please use the form that is located to the right. And uh, with that said, I'll hand it over to you, Philip. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, and all very welcome to our webcast regarding the third quarter of uh, this year, 2022. Uh, we uh, at iTech uh, are proud to present uh, this strong quarter, a quarter with a very uh, strong movement in the positive direction. Uh, actually, the strongest quarter so far in basically any aspect. And we will obviously dive into that. Uh, other things that has happened over the quarter uh, was a good technical conference, uh, maybe not so big in, in, uh, in the investor sector, but from a technical standpoint, uh, it's, we're happy to see that iTech is in the center of bringing this industry together, discussing technical matters, uh, knowing that there's no real obvious platform for this industry to discuss together. Our mission is to bring people together, make sure we enhance each other's capability to continue to innovate. And we're happy to take the lead in this initiative. Uh, so therefore, uh, some proudness on that. And if you followed us on LinkedIn, you've seen a lot of that. We also uh, know, uh, acknowledge, uh, finally, I should say, uh, some strong contributions, or at least starting to see the contributions from the larger number of premium products that now are available on the market. Uh, as you know, some of those uh, came out under the COVID times in 2021, uh, and that uh, has been an um, interesting time to see when they actually show off in our numbers, and now they do. So that's the introduction to the quarter. Uh, I'll walk you through uh, as many aspects as I can. Uh, initially, there are a few slides on who we are for those who may be new. So iTech is a uh, Swedish-based, uh, actually Gothenburg-based uh, biotech company acting in the coating technology field. Uh, we're listed uh, as a NASDAQ First North um, entity. We are relying heavily on strong IPR, that is patents, both in the back end and front end. And it includes in this industry and the so um, difficult to achieve regulatory approvals, where we are one of very few companies to actually hold regulatory approvals in the marine industry uh, for any kind of compound actually, but certainly exclusively for our compound. So that, that sets a quite high entry barrier and a, a very unique position. The purpose with what we do is to make shipping more efficient. Uh, it is to keep the underwater, underwater hull uh, as smooth as ever possible over the duration of time, meaning avoiding marine growth that will enhance uh, drag and create few losses. So the cleaner it is, the, the more efficient the ship becomes. The sustainability aspects are obviously important and that doesn't only count for what's going up to there, but also what's released uh, into the water. So how is that done? Uh, it's through our one product, the ingredient technology Selectope, that is uh, part of an advanced coating system uh, sold by the global paint makers, meaning that we become a supplier to them uh, the setup of all this and knowing that the number of uh, leading paint makers is highly limited makes our business case very scalable. Uh, so we can reach high numbers without adding other investments, new investments or a lot of people. Uh, and all of this uh, makes the company uh, unique and, and very interesting uh, to look at from, from an investor standpoint and also to work in, of course, for, for us. Uh, I touched upon the sustainability aspects, and, and that is the big thing in this industry as well as in many others. It's the right window of the opportunity right now coming in through with this kind of technology. Not the least because shipping is recognized to be uh, responsible for some 23 to 2.6% of global CO2 emissions, equaling the total consumption of, of Germany as a nation, as an example. Uh, that itself puts some light to the industry that there is savings uh, to be made and forced to be made actually to, to make sure that global transport of goods can, can continue to occur without uh, negative uh, effects on, on the environment or on the oceans as such. Uh, in this case, looking at the anti-fouling coatings or, or any hull coating 
actually. The potential within the industry is claimed to be around 100 million tons of CO2 savings versus the average uh, situation on the fleet as of tw uh, 2009. So if all those ships uh, uh, had the most optimal hull coatings, this is the number of CO2 levels that could be saved. Selectope is a part in that puzzle, of course, and that's driving our motivation to, to go to work. Uh, but it's not only about emissions to, to air, it's about what's uh, going into the sea as well. So protecting the marine ecosystems is a detrimental part. Uh, and that's uh, twofold. It's, it's both what you release into the, the ocean, meaning uh, approved uh, active agents dash biocides are, are clearly advantages. And certainly those who are uh, very specific, like Selectope, has a very uh, favorable profile in this area. But it's also the combined effect of coatings and its uh, ingredients to avoid um, con uh, transport of alien species, sometimes invasive species, uh, which is recognized as a big problem on a fouled hull. Uh, so that's an important area. Uh, and the third area is obviously to preserve natural resources and to try to use as little as possible uh, to um, uh, do the job, so to say. Uh, all the, the well, the limited amounts of agents available are all needed. The question is how to optimize the mattresses for the best possible output, both on performance and, and the leaching into the seas. Selecto plays a role here, being uh, uh, an interesting candidate uh, combined with most of the other agents. So these three aspects is uh, important for us. Uh, more in depth than what do we do? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's a biotech inspired company, so to say. Uh, it started off with research in a very niche, almost geeky area called barnacle larvae understanding or sciences uh, that combines biological sciences, chemical sciences and so on to actually understand why these creatures settle and how they are built up to see if there's any way to repel them from a surface rather than use excessive amounts of, of uh, previously at least questionable compounds to, to, to kill them. Uh, the, the result of that quite extensive research at the Gothenburg University and Chalmers was a molecule that we now call Selectope that's um, part of the paint system and actually has a very repellent effect on specifically the, the barnacle larvae and to a certain extent on tube worms. The specificity of the molecule makes it possible to use in tremendously small quantities. Uh, which is a big uh, interesting advantage for the paint makers who then can find different ways of formulate. But it also gets into the scope of being possible to combine with a lot of other things. So it acts together with other active agents in the paint to, to deliver its, uh, uh, its effect. So it's the first time ever biological sciences is driven into the paint system to actually create this uh, unique effect. Uh, and then needless to say from, from the previous slides, it's also approved then uh, on both the regulatory end, but also in uh, confirmed and approved by paint makers that it does work quite. And it's also very powerful, as you see from the picture at the bottom here, where you have a smooth area with Selectope uh, with no growth uh, and a, a more traditional type of coating with a lot of growth. So uh, Selectope acts as a booster or it can even replace and reduce uh, amount of other chemi uh, chemicals in the paint to deliver the performance needed. Uh, so obviously we're in the shipping industry. Uh, the potential if all of the boats, the, the industrial boats and the big commercial vessels would use uh, Selectope in every single liter of anti-fouling, we would head towards the 350 to 500 million dollar market potential on sales of our product. Of course, uh, there are other alternatives to, to, uh, to protect your ship. Um, so we're reaching, trying to reach and grab as far as we can uh, in this journey, but that's the maximum potentials. When we started off this, uh, we were all thinking that the leisure boat market would be the, the easy grab because uh, simply it's not five years between each repaint. It's maybe one year, maybe two years. Uh, there's a lot of boats laying uh, still most of the time uh, uh, and then hence having hard fouling uh, as their main problem, which also is quite uh, um, difficult to get away from a maintenance perspective. 
but it turned out to be super difficult from a from a regulatory perspective as the whole industry is in a complete uh, revamp of regulatory uh, criteria and therefore that market at least in Europe is uh, not accessible for new active agents at the moment uh, so uh, that took a shift back in 2010 somewhere around there where we start to understand that other other uh, markets are more compelling and that's where you save fuel so the fuel driving aspect became so much more interesting and also obviously the volumes so we looked at the leftmost pictures uh, mostly then from 2010 uh, on to where we are today so all our sales almost are into this commercial shipping industry of huge ships uh, transporting goods over the oceans the large atlantic oceans so to say the further you go the more uh, important the fuel bill is and the more import um, uh, the more attention you pay to the the efficiency measures the hull coatings being one of those the good thing with all this is that there are many of those vessels and they have to dry dock every three to five years depending on age and so on uh, that means that there's a recurring amount of of uh, ships coming into to the dry dock and there's a recurring amount of opportunities to apply new paint hopefully most of those will select open in the future but that's uh, then we also see that the working boats uh, could be supply ships tugboats a uh, lot of other more local coastal ferries and uh, ships that also uses uh, uh, anti-foulings and pays a lot of attention to not only the fuel bill but it, the environmental concerns in the more uh, nearby uh, water environments uh, normally that translates into avoiding transport of alien species that may come from the larger ships and the smaller ships are then uh, take spreading this problem around the coastline so they also pay a lot of attention to coatings uh, also in that area a lot of ships uh, very fixed dry docking intervals altogether very interesting annual opportunities for a paint maker uh, we are uh, happy to say that despite we're not looking actively, or we are looking actively, but understanding there is a long delay in this process, we do have some products uh, on the leisure boat market, but not uh, explicitly in the in the larger European market. It's mainly related to Japan at the moment. Uh, we are trying to put ourselves in a nice position in the United States in this area, as well as some other countries um, where leisure boating is uh, prominent. So this is what we do. This is the market. Uh, and now let's move into to the quarter. Needless to say, and I guess you have read uh, the very strong numbers uh, of the quarter uh, of 21.3 million in, in net sales compared to 13.8. That's a 54% difference. Uh, very proud uh, to after so many years, uh, well, so many years, so many quarters during the COVID time to have not seen the growth curve coming back up. Now it is. Uh, that, that is uh, clearly exciting. Uh, gross margin uh, maintains us at good levels. Growing uh, with maintained gross margin is good and even better to also present a strong EBITDA on, on the growth curve. And essentially, this is uh, uh, the essence of our business model, uh, actually. We have had uh, some struggle with cash flow previously, uh, at least uh, from a quarterly report perspective, although we're quite solid on this over a year time so to say now it turns out really good uh, with uh, on this quarter cash balance is also very strong uh, as you all know there, there's large variations in currency exchange rates at the moment uh, we're happy enough to have uh, uh, sourcing in dollars selling in dollars and relatively low cost in in, in swedish kroner which means we do have an effect on the uh, magnitude of the numbers uh, although the percentages um, on gross margin, as an example, remain the same, obviously, uh, if the currency moves up or down, but the magnitude clearly is affected. Uh, the organic growth is 26%, and that's an important number to for you to keep in mind. Uh, obviously, the EBITDA margin of 32% is very, very attractive, uh, shows some indication of the potential in this business model. So what's driving this? Well, uh, this quarter was uh, a strong dominant uh, position from our largest customer who, who is, we believe now is starting to experience a, a stronger demand of their many select hope containing products. There's 15 or more, uh, not on the global scale, but in their different regions combined with the global availability of, of products. So that is hopefully, well, that is likely the, the driving force in this quarter. And we, we hope to see more of that, of course. 
Uh, it's the first quarter we really see an effect of those launches uh, of new products that they did certainly in Japan uh, in 2021. So that gives us some confidence that those are actually being pushed into the market in a, in a good way. Uh, we do have some lower operating expenses that supports the profitability, uh, meaning keeping control of cash, but also uh, planning differently. And sometimes the third quarter comes in a bit lower on the on the expenses side. Quarter four normally a bit higher on the expenses side, so that will probably shift a bit. Uh, there is also delays in the regulatory system. I wrote a bit about that in the CEO statements that uh, we have a delay in the US. Uh, administrative burden on these, uh, uh, what do you call them, institutions, the, the, the chemical agencies or environmental agencies is extremely high. Uh, and it's not only related to, to us at ITEC. We, we hear the same from our customers who need to register the products, from our fellow colleagues with other active agents. Uh, it is super difficult to get attention and to keep any sort of timeline uh, when it comes to, to um, uh, authorities at the moment. So many of the investments that were expected to come in, uh, uh, impacting cash flow then, of course, uh, in the year will not come in because we don't get the responses needed from, from authorities, mainly than in the US. I should also say, which also highlight in the, in the annual report, and that's just for information, that um, for that same reason, uh, there's been a, a delay in, in uh, expectations of uh, conclusions of reapplications and new applications within the European Union. Uh, so that's just for, for a, noting, uh, a noting remark, so to say. So we have two and a half years uh, ahead now before any uh, re-evaluation will be performed. Okay, we uh, look at the first nine months now, uh, comparing the first nine months of uh, several years, um, uh, the last four years in this case. And you see also our traditional 12 months rolling curve displaying the, the EBITDA figures, revenues and gross margins. Starting then on, on the left hand side still, we, we for the first nine months are exceeding the full year sales of uh, 2021. We're exceeding any other quarter in the past. Uh, as you see, the 2020, 2021 were flat years, even decreasing a bit. Obviously not the most exciting times. Uh, uh, now it's looking better. Um, in more in the direction we were hoping and expecting and the direction we saw uh, until uh, COVID hit uh, in the middle of 2022, uh, 2020. Gross margins remain strong, uh, even increasing uh, at the same time as uh, net sales are increasing. There is a certain volume correlation here, but, but it's also a customer mix uh, discussion and it's also uh, incremental improvements uh, here and there. Um, so positives on all those figures for the first nine months, uh, which I think is the first time ever uh, comparing these years. Uh, very, very sound uh, quarterly performance here. Uh, retaking the growth curve is important. Uh, and we made our uh, small calculation on the CAGR from IPO year 2018, comparing again the first nine months with each other, finding a, almost a 30% growth uh, over that period on CAGR. So uh, a quality based metric showing that we're we're on the move, although we had some some uh, disruption in the growth for a few years. Um, I think that that's about it on this slide. I mean, I said that the uh, business model is proving itself. Uh, that that is maybe the main message of this and that we really are, are on the right track again. Uh, and there's a, still a growth potential, of course, as, as we do have less contributions from other customers this quarter. Uh, if all of these start to work uh, and come in with a growth figure on the same quarter, we will obviously have even better figures. And needless to say, there is a lot of potential out there. We're still only uh, at the very start of the growth curve in all our customer accounts. And we haven't really got the traction on the leisure boat market either uh, that will at some point contribute, uh, although much later. Uh, to display a bit on what's going on uh, in the past years, I'll give you some more ideas on, on explaining the, the, the result and maybe doing your own estimations for the future. We have seen an increase of products to the market. Uh, we're now above 20 uh, commercial available products. I'm um, again stating these are not globally available, all of them. Uh, they are heavily skewed towards certain Asian countries, but those are countries with high activity. That is Korea and Japan specifically. 
And another important metric is the number of customers that are picking up the technology from a commercial standpoint. Uh, we have six of the nine largest customers uh, in the world using uh, the Selector product in their paints on a regular basis. Uh, so that, that's an important quality measure that not only one customer is using it, although they're dominating, we're, we're seeing a, a good pickup uh, among the others. And I also have to say that all of the nine largest brands, including a tail of a few, are working intensively in the R&D departments, finding ways to, to use Selectope in their best way on their markets. Uh, so the underlying activities is uh, more expanded than what you see on this slide. Unfortunately, many of these customers don't want to have communication out there, uh, meaning we are not able to talk about who all these are. We only have three in the official domain, but now we know there are some three more that are uh, continuously contributing. This is a slide on some general uh, aspects on the shipping industry. It's not directly related to Selecto, but sometimes good uh, to, to give you a glance of what's in the analytical reports out there. Uh, so first of all is the Clark Sea Index, which is a, a weighted in the index of the uh, earnings of the of the rates, freight rates uh, across all ship types, uh, and that uh, you know it obviously has a big variances between container ships and bulk ships and so on. But disregarding all that, you see that uh, the ship owners in general are making much more money now than in the past, uh, and even uh, the, the index is at levels not too far away from the very extreme peak it was uh, just before uh, 20, uh, 29, um, 2009. It's coming down uh, lately now, but still at high level. So the earnings is positive because that means they are ready or putting themselves in position where they at least get more interested to invest in long-term uh, efficiency technologies, such as the best possible anti-fouling coatings with the best possible uh, hull uh, preparation methods. Um, so that is uh, good. That's maybe the biggest uh, takeaway from this slide. So high earnings increases the investment appetite, uh, and we, we look forward to see more of that, although there's a lot of uncertainty on, on inflation and so on at the moment. But if this remains, it looks good. Uh, another uh, slide uh, now relating to the new building market. Uh, as you know, we're, many of our products out there are related to the new building uh, segment uh, of large ships. Uh, we see that the order book of versus the total fleet is about uh, 10%. So 10% of the fleet is under renewal, that, that is. Uh, compare them to around 50% uh, in the order books in, 20, in 2008. So. We think that although the, the, the contracts are lower uh, 2022 than, than before, they will bounce back up uh, to, because the fleet needs to be renewed in a faster speed to, to uh, comply to future CO2 requirements, uh, meaning uh, being equipped with engines that can manage dual fuels, uh, other technologies that are, are normally fitted onto a new build vessels and so on. Uh, so I think we're waiting to, to see a bigger pickup on this general industry. Uh, limiting factor at the moment is the capacity at yards. Uh, I think there's about, uh, you know, it's 40% below many shut down. Uh, there's about, uh, I think, uh, 110 or so active yards at the moment of larger scale compared to 300 plus uh, in 2009. So it's been a huge uh, shrinkage, uh, shortage of new building yard capacity in the world following the economical crisis since the super trend uh, that brought us up to 2008. And that, of course, <laughs> makes it difficult to place an order and have any sort of expectation on when to get it. But it also pushes up prices on new building, combine them with increased steel prices and so on. That, that also is one of the explanations why the, the orders are not uh, booming in 2022, despite the need to renew the fleets. Uh, the positive uh, is the outlook moving forward. The challenge is the current situation on, on capacity and, and uh, raw material pricing. This is our last slide. Uh, we try to share some own views on, on our opportunities and challenges for you to guide yourself in the estimations moving forward. We definitely see uh, a continued effect of the introduction in January 2023 now. Uh, of the CII, the, the um, Carbon Intensity Index, which is a driver to improve day-to-day uh, -day performance on a ship. That includes uh, 
having to do a lot of investments to put yourself in a position where you get a strong rating and then you get a better charter uh, contract and then you probably get better financing and better insurance terms maybe even in the future. That is driving this industry in the premium direction, even to the ultra premium uh, uh, direction of, of coatings. And that's where Select Hope belongs. Uh, that's important and will be important for quite some years ahead. We do have a growing customer base. That's important. Everybody doesn't want to work with any customer. It's important for us that we're, we are available and an option in any paint maker's portfolio list. Uh, and we hope to be able to expand from the new building area to the dry docking area. Uh, we do have ex uh, we do experience an enhanced activity in the customer's R and D uh, development portfolio. We cannot go into details at all or or highlight any specific example. We're just uh, confirming that we're getting closer, getting into more activity, and we're also through our own investments putting ourselves in a position where we can provide more relevant information on how to handle how to formulate with Select Hope. Um, in the new circumstances that, that our regulatory bodies are, are putting forward in different regions. Uh, on the challenge side, it's obviously the delay of, of regulatory processes. EPA is delayed, uh, you know, I think one and a half years since we started, and that's going to be a long process. Uh, we're used to that in this industry, unfortunately, but it's always tough. The EU PPR is also in delay. It doesn't affect us that much. Uh, the EPA does affect us because we, we need a starting point there. Uh, and then there's a uh, global economic challenges with lower expectations on GDPs in many areas, uh, short term, hopefully, and that, that will pick up as soon as we hopefully get back to more normal geopolitical situation at, at some point. But um, yeah, that's estimations and expectations on all different directions. Raw material prices are still a, a challenge for many, uh, although I think it's moving in the right direction. For us, this is not really a problem at the moment. Uh, it seems like from, from a customer perspective and certainly not in our own backyard. So with those words, uh, say thank you for, for tuning in. Um, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, Philip. And now we'll move over to the Q&A section. Start off with the first question. With a growing cash position of about 50 million sec, are you planning on dividends or are you looking for investments? If so, what are you looking for? So that's a re relevant question and a question that is uh, um, being uh, discussed at the moment because that's, you know, seeing the good trends in the company, one, one has, we can make a different uh, perspective on what kind of cash we need for bad times and so on. So now it looks strong. That's why we can start a discussion on how to expand and use this money in the best possible way. Uh, I would say that it goes more in the direction of finding a, a, a way to build iTech stronger rather than provide dividends. But that's uh, not finalized in a discussion in the board yet, but I, that's the direction I would believe it goes. Thank you. We'll take the next question. You mentioned in the report the administrative backlog of European authorities regarding biocides. Could you elaborate a little more firmly what this means to you? Uh, definitely, and I, 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 need, I need to go to uh, explain further. That it's a backlog also on the paints, uh, so both paints and biocides need to get through. ITEC and Selectope, alongside our fellow active agents in the industry, are approved in the EU system. The problem is that that's not enough. The paint makers need to get approval of their paints as well in the system to be able to sell them. And there's a 12 year backlog here. Uh, so uh, although we together with our fellow colleagues were approved around 2014 to 2016, 17 on the buy side level, only one single anti-fouling product has been approved since the regulation was uh, implemented in 2012. So like 10 years down the line, only one product has come through. So that doesn't affect those who had products on the market with known technologies before that date. That means traditional copper-based, uh, you know, uh, paints with um, agents that's been known longer than what Selectop has been known. They continue to sell uh, and, and can have read across on on product updates and so on. But for the new buy size, which means uh, Selectop and another one called Econia, it's super difficult to get into the European uh, revenue stream because uh, it's just a total mass of backlog in, in the European system. 
So that does uh, affect us in, in the sense that our customers cannot get their products through and we cannot get the sales in Europe to the levels they, they should be. Uh, there are certain exceptions where some European countries have said that they will uh, use old legislation until uh, agreements are reached on the new one. But that's limited to a few countries. So sales in Europe are to a very limited amount of, of countries. Uh, so that's the direct effect in Europe. And I think that was the only question. There was nothing on EPA in that question, right? Correct. And the uh, next question here. Do you see any risks for inventory buildup from your largest customers? Or should one consider the accelerated growth trend to continue driven by underlying demand? The uh, inventory balances are uh, said to be in uh, the, sorry, the inventory levels are said to be in good balance. Uh, we believe this is the effect of actual growth. Okay, thank you. Take the next question. Why isn't Selectope included in all paintings your partners sell? Why well, it's not included in all in all paints? Was that a question? Okay, yeah, um, so most importantly because there are other uh, more uh, established alternatives that have been working for many, many years and that creates comfort. It's also so that all ships doesn't need all type of, of uh, active agents or all time have the same profile on the anti-fouling coating, so to say. So some simply are in less need of, of a select up version maybe, uh, while others are more in need of that power. Um, so that explains it. Uh, and also the fact that uh, some authorities are uh, very late in, a, uh, <laughs> in approving products uh, puts them in a position where they need to have a different product um, portfolio in, in one part of the world and a different one in Europe. That may have its uh, issues as well. And then I think the third thing is uh, generally it takes a long time to optimize a coating that uh, uh, is compatible or competing. Uh, possible to compete with in terms of cost uh, um, performance benefit to those who's been proven for a long, long time where they have the guarantees in place and all that. It takes time to build up a new product portfolio with a guarantee scheme on the same level they have on the ones that they've been running for the last 20, 25 years. And uh, regarding your European customers, would you say that they impacted by the negative, or that they are impacted by the negative macro trends? at all? Our uh, customers uh, are definitely impacted uh, by, um, in a certain way, I, I would assume. I'm not sure in, in what magnitude. I think shipping is doing quite well, as I sh saw on the, uh, showed on the slide. So they are, uh, our paint maker customers are probably having quite decent discussions with their customers because their money is there and they need to do a transformation to more sustainable uh, operators. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think that's overweighting other problems at the moment. But of course, if the negative the negatives of this inflation uh, uh, cuts consumption, cuts the need for shipping goods, then we're in a completely different situation, of course. The only thing we need is the ships will anyway need a coating. The question is if they're well financed enough to, to continue the efficiency journey or if they will have to pause it. And I do believe, and that's only my own reflection, that the pressure on, on the, uh, creating a greater efficiency gain on the shipping level will be stronger than the negative effects. Thank you. Take the next question. You had an increase in other operating income. What is the underlying driver for that? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I have to check that with the CFO, of course, but, but we do have uh, currency contributions that potentially are there. Uh, there's no other sales going on in, in the company. We're not getting uh, um, paid for other things than our product. So I will have to come back to that more in detail. So please email me that question again. And uh, do you expect currency adjusted growth to accelerate the coming quarters or to remain constant or even decline? It's difficult to say where the currency is going. Uh, a lot of people know tremendously more about that than I do. Uh, we focus on organic growth, the, the actual growth on, on the volumes we ship out. And we believe there's uh, good grounds to expect a positive outlook on, on this, uh, as long as the global trend doesn't change completely. Uh, but where the currency will go, I don't know. Uh, very difficult to say. But I could also maybe clarify that uh, we're buying in dollars and selling in dollars, which means the magnitude of the numbers you see is obviously dependent on the exchange rates quite a lot. 
but uh, the relative numbers within each quarter, such as the percentage of gross margin, remains the same uh, even if the currencies go up and down. Could you elaborate on the reasons of the slowdown from some of your leading customers? There is no uh, no logical uh, explanation to that. That's just a vari variation over over the years that comes in. They maybe didn't get the contracts they were expected to get. Uh, these products are normally for the new building market, so uh, they, they maybe lost pro uh, lost uh, projects to a competitor. They may have uh, found other um, deals to make with that chip owner applying different coating of a lower grade because there was another issue another end of the ship i don't know this is uh, movements that come and go all the time so there's no there's no uh, conclusions to be drawn from this would you classify the macro environment as favorable or unfavorable given the inflation and oil prices uh, uh, oil prices are generally good because that, that sets the light to uh, the, f the, the, the good um, uh, payback on uh, efficiency investments. So on that end, that's good. Inflation, as long as it doesn't impact uh, global trade, uh, I, I guess, uh, and I'm hoping that everybody can absorb <laughs> the, the inflation all the way through, uh, then that doesn't matter. But if that starts to put an impact on how people consume, uh, and how much goods is then needed to be transported, the whole industry will be impacted by, by lower profitability. And at some point that will harm also the, the more high-end products in this industry. And uh, finally, what's your outlook for 2023? Uh, we, uh, again, we, we don't uh, provide outlooks uh, to, to uh, the public, uh, although we at some point quite soon, within probably quarter, fir quarter one next year, we'll have new public uh, targets out there, but uh, we continue to do our work, continue to uh, try to grow organically uh, as much as we can. And we, we see a lot of positivism in, in this end. And then there's things that we can't control uh, that we, you know, we'll have to talk about quarter by quarter. Okay, thank you very much, Philip, for, for presenting today and answering our questions. And a big thanks to all of you who listened to this presentation with iTake. I hope you have a great rest of the day and I'll see you next time. Thank you and uh, goodbye.